not sure if it is recording. Sorry. About the recording. No, now, now it is recording. I think okay. so. Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much for the invitation to come and speak and for the very kind introduction. Today I want to tell you about some of the tools that we're building to help people understand how brain circuits work and how they go wrong in diseases. Uh, my dream is that someday we will have a computational model of the brain. <clears throat> Ideally, it would, it would both be biologically realistic, but also human comprehensible. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat is a little bit rusty, maybe from too much talking. <clears throat> okay. In order to achieve such models, we think we need at least three kinds of technology. First, we have to make maps of the molecules and the wiring of the brain. Second, we have to control the high-speed dynamics of the brain. And finally, we have to watch the brain in action. These are difficult things to do because the brain is very complicated. Brain cells are enormous, but their connections are tiny. And the wiring that connects cells to each other is also very tiny, even nanoscale. Also, the high-speed signals within brain cells are very fast and drive processes like learning or Alzheimer's disease or uh, emotions that can take place over very long time scales. So for each of these three problems, mapping, controlling, and watching, we have to build a new technology. And so today I'll tell you three short stories, focusing mostly on new things that we're trying to do about mapping, controlling, and observing. Now in each case, we had to really think about the properties of the brain in order to build a good tool. So the first story I'll tell you, the first half of the talk, will be, will be about mapping. Why is mapping the brain so hard? Well, brain cells are enormous in the human brain, even centimeters in spatial size, but the connections are nanoscale. It's hard to image nanoscale things. There's super resolution microscopy, there's electron microscopy, but both of these tools struggle to image large 3D objects like brains. So in our group, we started thinking about how we could try to do the opposite. Rather than zoom in, could we make the brain bigger? Could we chemically synthesize chains of swellable polymers, as shown on the left-hand side of the slide, and make those polymers so dense and so even that they go inside cells and outside cells, in between biomolecules and around biomolecules, as shown on the right-hand side of the slide. If we could do it very evenly, Maybe we could pull apart biomolecules from each other. Now the physics of swallowable polymers has a long history. In 1980, for example, the MIT scientist Toyuchi Tanaka worked out the physics of swallowable polymers, like the kind in baby diapers. So in this cartoon, the polymer threads are nanoscale and shown as white lines. If you add water, osmosis draws the water in, the polymers swell apart from each other and it can increase in size by a thousand times or more in volume. Next, you have to install this dense mesh of polymer inside the brain. You cannot do this while the brain is alive, of course. This will not be a functional way of imaging, but it's an anatomical way of imaging. And it turns out Christine Dreyer and Peter Hausen in 1981 showed how to do this. You can take a specimen, preserved, not living, <clears throat> Excuse me. and soak it in a chemical cocktail. The chemical cocktail contains monomers, in their case, acrylamide. The monomers assemble through a process called polymerization into a polymer, in their case, polyacrylamide. And this polyacrylamide mesh or hydrogel winds its way throughout the tissue, inside cells and outside cells, in between biomolecules and around biomolecules. So if you do it just right, maybe you can make a chemical mesh that's very dense and very even and turn a cell like the one on the left to something like on the right, a constellation of biomolecules hovering in space. Two biomolecules that are touching will now be some minimum distance apart. And two biomolecules that are some distance apart will now be scaled up by some linear factor. Now, if you think about it, the chemical synthesis method has been around since 1981 and the physics of these polymers has been studied since 1980. 
So maybe this could have been invented a half century ago. To make it work though, we had to invent several other chemistries. In this cartoon, proteins are shown in brown. We had to develop anchors shown in purple that would bind to the proteins and give them each a little handle or anchor. We now have developed handles or anchors for proteins, DNA, RNA, and now we're also working on handles for lipids and sugars. Why the handle? Well, we want to make those polymers through a process called polymerization. Here you can see the monomers shown as little white spheres, and they self-assemble into long strings called polymers. Now, if you just do that, you can make the swellable polymer throughout the tissue, but you want the polymer to connect to the handle. That way, when the polymer swells, the handles will let you pull the biomolecules apart from each other. <clears throat> In the next step, we soften the tissue or cells. We add enzymes, detergents, heat, and we loosen up all the molecules from each other or even destroy ones we don't want. Then we add water and the polymer, sodium polyacrylate, basically the same stuff as in baby diapers, swells. But because of the handles, the biomolecules get pulled apart. We call this expansion microscopy. In panel B is a piece of the mouse brain. And panel C is the same piece of mouse brain after we expand it. It expands by about 100 times in volume, about four or five fold in each direction. The polymer starts out very dense, like in the upper left hand of the slide. The spacing between polymer threads is very tiny, around the size of a single biomolecule. That's why we thought it would bring nano features into the realm of the visible. It would make small things big enough to see the polymer ends up swollen or extended. Here's a movie of a piece of the mouse brain being expanded. The movie is sped up by about 50 fold. We created the polymer before the movie and then we add the water right about there. I hope you can see this piece of brain is swelling before your very eyes. So we call this expansion microscopy. By design, because the polymer is so dense and so even, we want to make nanoscale features like neural wiring and molecules uh, large, uh, spaced apart from each other so we can see them. So cells become bigger, molecules become farther apart, synapses become bigger, neural axons and dendrites become bigger. All the biomolecules are being spread out because the polymer is so dense and so even but we had to prove it too. We spent a lot of time taking pre-expansion images with regular super resolution microscopes, like SIM microscopes and storm microscopes, classical ways of doing nano imaging. Then we would take post-expansion images on a confocal microscope or epifluorescent microscope. We could compare the pre and post-expansion images and calculate the distortion as shown here. Pre is in purple, post is in green we can calculate the amount of distortion. We found it was not zero, but it was very small. Over a typical microscope field of view, the distortion was only a few percent. That's enough for most microscopy applications. We also can look at the resolution. We can look at microtubules, for example, which we know their exact size. We stain them with fluorescent antibodies, and then we can image them before expansion on a classical super resolution microscope, and then after expansion on a conventional confocal microscope. And so what we found was that indeed the resolution was nanoscale. If you expand four and a half fold, then the microscope that you use would be four and a half times more precise. Now earlier I told you that the polymer threads are only a couple nanometers apart. If you expand big enough, could you see even better? As I'll show you later in the talk, we can do that. But even with only four or five fold expansion, there are many things you can see. On the left-hand side of the slide, we're zooming in on a piece of the mouse brain. Each white square 
is blown up into the image below. The color code is shown on the left. We're using antibodies against a fluorescent protein, shown in green, a presynaptic protein, shown in blue, and a postsynaptic protein, shown in magenta. The right-hand side shows the same fields of view, but after we expand. As you can see, synapses are hard to see before we expand. You see lots of purple blobs. But afterwards, you can see the blue and magenta halves of the synapse, as exemplified in the lower right. Furthermore, if you look at the gap between these two protein densities, you get the same answer that Catherine Dulac and Zhao Wei Zhuang measured many years ago with storm microscopy, a classical super resolution method that Zhao Wei invented. But now, you can take these images on regular existing microscopes. So to summarize, we've discovered that we can physically magnify objects. You can take a specimen, polymerize a dense hydrogel throughout it, soften it, and expand it evenly. And so it lets you do multi-scale imaging. You can look at a brain circuit and zoom in all the way to a single axon, synapse, or dendrite with great precision. Furthermore, this means that ordinary microscopes that most people already can access are now nanoimaging devices. We kind of upgraded every microscope out there to improve its resolution. <clears throat> now, if you have a specialized microscope, you can take advantage of the expansion process. In the upper left is a piece of mouse brain before we expand, and in the lower left is after we expand. If you expand 100 times in volume by adding water, then it is mostly water. That means it's completely transparent. You've diluted the contents by 100 fold. What this means is you can use clever tricks like shine light from the side and take a picture from a 90 degree angle, so-called light sheet imaging. I should point out that this initial paper was done by two then graduate students, Fei Chen and Paul Tilburg in our group. Recently, we collaborated with Eric Betzig's group he developed a light, a light sheet microscope that can shine light from one side and take a picture from another side. It works because our sample is transparent. In work that was spearheaded by Ray Gao, Shoa Sanal, and Goku Apadiyula, working with the Betsig lab and my lab, we found that we could image about a thousand times faster, almost, than a classical super resolution method. We can label mitochondria and lysosomes, as you see in the upper right, or myelin, as you can see in the lower left, expand, use the light sheet microscope, and go at very fast speeds. We can also color code brain cells. We can express fluorescent proteins from jellyfish and corals and other organisms and give each neuron a unique color co code, so-called brainbow. By delivering fluorescent proteins to brain cells randomly using viruses, we can make each neuron have a different color code. Now, if you image the brain, you can get a blurry image. For example, in the middle top, you can see some green blobs with arrows pointing at them. That's before you expand. After you expand, you can very cleanly see individual wires of the brain. So by color coding neurons using viral delivery of fluorescent proteins and expansion, we and many others are now trying to make maps of brain circuits. Everything I showed you so far is by imaging proteins. What about other biomolecules like nucleic acids? Oz Wasti and Fei Chen showed that we could expand and then label RNA. Here, you can see an example where they apply two anchors, one for proteins and one for RNA. You can see some proteins in green here, for example, the yellow fluorescent protein. In magenta are individual dots that represent messenger RNAs. So now we can map two kinds of biomolecule, proteins and RNAs in the same sample. So I've now told you that we can image proteins and RNAs throughout brain circuits with nanoscale precision and on regular microscopes. But everything I've showed you so far is expanding by only about fourfold. Can we expand bigger? Well, when J.B. Chang was a postdoc in our group, we developed a protocol to take a piece of brain, polymerize and expand it, 
then form a second polymer in the space opened up by the first expansion and expand it again. We call this iterative expansion. If you expand fourfold two times in a row, the final expansion is four times four or 16. This could give you extremely fine resolution because now your microscope will have 16 times better performance. The, the, the initial version of iterative expansion required chemical synthesis, but a new version, which we posted in a bioarchive led by Deblina Sarkar, Jinyun Kang, and Oz Wasi, we found that we can do this with all off-the-shelf chemicals. Take a brain, form a polymer mesh, expand it, form a second polymer in the space opened up by the first expansion, and you can expand it again. Using this technique, we can get very fine pictures of synapses such as those shown at the bottom. We're staining with three antibodies against PSC95, Homer 1, and Bassoon, in where my mouse is pointing, in panel E. Panel F shows three other proteins, and panel G shows three other proteins. And the resolution is very good, just around 20 nanometers, equal to the best super resolution methods for brain imaging out there. But again, you can do all this on a regular microscope. Now, one of the fun features of this is that Deblina, Jinyoung, and Oz's protocol expands proteins away from each other. That gives us, gives us a second advantage. We don't just get better resolution, but we decrowd proteins from each other. We separate proteins from each other. Why is that important? Well, if you bring in antibodies to label proteins, the antibodies are big. There are some proteins that are too crowded to label. In the upper right, for example, you see two antibodies, one green and one red, that are labeling two proteins. But if we separate proteins from each other, we make more room for antibodies to access the internal proteins. Now you can see the red and green antibodies labeling their targets, but a blue and a yellow one also. This is a very crowded slide, but at the top are some examples of antibodies against calcium channels, presynaptic proteins like RIM and postsynaptic proteins like PSC95. And the take home message is that if we do pre-expansion staining, shown in yellow, we get very bad labeling. If we restain after we expand the proteins away from each other, we get much better labeling, shown in magenta. So if you look at each yellow and magenta pair, the yellow shows barely any signal, but the magenta shows a lot of signal. Not all proteins are crowded though. If we look at Homer 1, Bassoon or Shank 3, you can look at the yellow and magenta pairs and the pre and post synaptic uh, stains look very similar. We can use the stains that look similar to validate the stains that look different. For example, one worry might be that the new staining might be nonspecific, but we see the stains increase at synapses. In other words, we can use the Shank, Bassoon and Homer stains, which are the same pre and post expansion as references and we see the calcium, RIM, and PSC95 stains increase at the reference synapses. That means we can do things like look at nanostructures of synapses. Collaborating with Tom Blanpied's group at the University of Maryland, we showed that the calcium channels exist as clusters, and the clusters are coordinated with postsynaptic proteins like PSC95. This extends this idea of the synaptic nano column, the idea that presynaptic proteins are organized parallel to the postsynaptic proteins. And we did, as shown at the bottom of the slide, a lot of statistics to show that the calcium channels on the presynaptic side are coordinated with the postsynaptic proteins, forming a coordinated pre and postsynaptic signaling apparatus. Working with Li Wei Sai's group at MIT, we examined Alzheimer's model mice, mice engineered with genes that make them accumulate amyloid similar to human patients. Again, amyloid plaques are very, very crowded. We found that presynaptic staining of amyloid resulted in very poor stains, as shown in yellow. Postsynaptic staining was much more dense. The plaques of amyloid were much more elaborate. I found this to be very reassuring. Amyloid plaques are very dense and tightly bound. The fact that we could expand the proteins away from each other means that we could expand some of the toughest protein aggregates we know. But importantly, we discovered new features as well. 
amyloid dots shown here in magenta. They're not just plaques, they're also these tiny periodic structures of amyloid. Maybe these are a new uh, feature of Alzheimer's that might present new hypotheses. For one thing, these amyloid dots are found along axons. Maybe this is one way that amyloid spreads in the brain. So to summarize, we can expand objects and do nanoimaging. This allows us to do nanoimaging on regular microscopes that you already probably have access to. But importantly, we also are able to decrowd proteins for better staining, making invisible features into visible ones. There are many things we have not validated. We cannot have validated things that are invisible. Uh, excuse me, let me start over because my children are, are entering the room here. Um, okay, they're just outside the door. Um, so we can expand things and compare those expanded images to earlier super resolution methods. But how do you validate tiny structures that are smaller than what we could see using earlier methods? We have to invent new methods of validation. Nevertheless, there are many applications of this technique. Yangshin Zhao and Octavia Bucur worked with my group and Andy Beck's group to show that we can expand human tissues. Shown here are examples of prostate, lung, breast, pancreas, and in not shown are other organ systems from humans. On the left are normal, and on the right are cancer-containing biopsies. In the upper right is the color code, a nuclear stain in blue, and antibodies against vimentin and keratin in green and red. Using this strategy, we could try to detect cancer earlier than before. A team of pathologists would grade breast cancer biopsies before expansion and after expansion. They used these votes to train a simple artificial intelligence. And if the training was done with post-expansion data shown as green circles, that was much more accurate than if the training was done on post uh, pre-expansion data, shown as magenta squares. This slide is very dense and not really meant to be read, but I want to send home two messages. The first is that expansion microscopy is very easy to do. Perhaps a thousand groups are already doing it. We did hands-on training of about 400 groups, um, although uh, with COVID-19, we can no longer do hands-on training. We have posted step-by-step -step cookbook style protocols at our website, expansionmicroscopy.org. The link is shown in the lower right. And the rest of the text on the slide are um, just the titles of papers that have come out doing expansion already. It's being used to study immune cells like T cells, fruit flies, Drosophila, how the of a flu virus spreads from one cell to the next, to look at kidneys, to look at the nucleus, to look at bacteria and the microbiome. And the list goes on and on and on. Over 175 papers and preprints have already come out doing some kind of expansion protocol. <clears throat> so we're about the halfway point of the talk. I hope this will be useful to your research. Uh, we have democratized nanoimaging. Now anybody can do nanoimaging with microscopes they already hopefully have access to. We've developed a simple protocol using all off-the-shelf chemicals where anybody can take cells and tissues and move the molecules apart from each other. This then allows ordinary microscopes to become nanoimaging devices. And furthermore, as I showed you near the end, we also decrowd molecules from each other to improve the staining. The improved staining then allows for better imaging of dense proteins like those at synapses or those found in amyloid plaques or other dense areas of cells. So please visit our website, expansionrecoscopy.org. We have some cookbook style, step-by-step -step protocols where anybody can learn how to do it. And new papers doing expansion are coming out all the time. Now, the big limit of expansion, of course, is that you cannot do it on a living system. The molecules are being pulled apart from each other. They are no longer functioning by talking to each other. In the last half of the talk, I wanna tell you about some things we're doing on the control and observation of living systems. <clears throat> I first want to talk about some old techniques that we worked on 
known as optogenetics for controlling neurons with light. Uh, although I want to focus the most of the rest of my time on new things, including some unpublished new tools. In optogenetics, we control high-speed dynamics of cells and tissues. Our initial focus was on the electrical signals of neurons. Neurons compute using electrical signals amongst other signals. <clears throat> we started this project, uh, Carl Dysroth and I, when we were both students at Stanford many years ago. We wanted to find a way to control the high-speed electrical signals that are very prominent in neurons. We started just by thinking about all the different laws of physics. How can you deliver energy to the brain? Magnetic fields, mechanical force, light. We decided light would be the most interesting if we could do it because it could be aimed at cells. You could bring light into the brain using optical fibers or other conduits. The next question was, how do you make neurons sense light since most do not? I got really fascinated by a set of papers that described an interesting set of molecules called microbial opsins. These were discovered half a century ago in microbes. Microbes use these molecules to convert light into electrical signals for energy storage or for light sensation. The first to be found, shown in the lower left, is, was a light-driven proton pump. It would sit in the membranes of microbes found in salty water, as shown in the upper left, and convert, convert light into a proton gradient, a chemical storage of solar energy. 10 years later, several groups found light-driven chloride pumps, also for energy storage. And then finally, around the turn of the millennium, people found light-driven ion channels in algae. So this looked very interesting. <clears throat> in a single molecule, you have all the different parts, a light sensor, um, a pump or channel that transports ions, and furthermore, it's all encoded by a small gene. What if we could put the gene into neurons? Would neurons be able to express these safely and effectively? Furthermore, these molecules require a molecule called all transretinal to sense the light, a cofactor. Would neurons have that or would we have to add it? To make a long story short, neurons have all transretinal enough to make these molecules work. What that means is we can express these genes in a fully genetically encoded way and make neurons activatable or silenceable by light. All three of these classes have yielded molecules that let us control neurons. Light-driven proton pumps, we found, Brian Chow and Shua Han, when they were working with me, found that we could express genes for light-driven proton pumps in neurons, shine green or yellow light on these neurons, and they will pump protons out and shut them down. And one of these molecules that we called ARCH is now very popular for neural silencing. Shua and also Amy Chuang worked with me to find light-driven chloride pumps that would work, that respond to yellow or red light to silence neurons by pumping chloride in. And finally, Carl Dysaroth and I originally collaborated to put light-driven ion channels into neurons and found that we could activate them with blue light. And Nathan Klepecki and my group worked to find versions that could be driven by red light. Young Ku Cho, Amy Yang, Demian Park, and others have also worked to improve these molecules. I'll just give you a few examples. When Amy Chuang was a grad student in my group, we worked to make a red light sensitive chloride pump. Put the gene for this light driven chloride pump that we called JAWS into neurons and shine red light even from outside the skull of an awake behaving mouse and you could turn off neurons, a majority of the depth through the brain. Why red light? Well, red light is less absorbed by the brain than other colors of visible light. So by putting this gene for JAWS into the brain and shining red light, we could turn off brain cells very deep. Leah Acker, working between my group and Bob Desimond's group, used JAWS to achieve the first change in primate behavior using rhesus macaques um, that was driven by cortical neural silencing using JAWS. When Nathan was a grad student in the group, he worked on a red light activator that we called Crimson. Crimson responds to red light by activating neurons. It's one of the light-driven ion channels. And this molecule has become very popular, for example, in fruit flies. Why fruit flies? Well, red light or infrared light can also 
allow you to escape visual artifacts. And so uh, Vivek J. Ehrman's group used crimson in fruit flies to achieve um, artifact-free behavior in fruit fly optogenetic control. <clears throat> Recently, we've worked with Valentina Emiliani's group to get the spatial resolution down to single cells. Valentina invents holographic projectors for the brain, like those shown at the top. Pulsed laser microscopes that create holograms. Holograms are three-dimensional sculptures of light, like what you see at the bottom. In a collaboration, Valeria Zimpini, Dimitri Tenese, and Or Shemesh, working between our two groups, worked on making a molecule and a microscope that are perfectly matched. One thing that Or did was to improve an idea that's been around for a while, which is to take uh, an opsin and to express it just at the cell body. Why do that? Well, suppose you have a holographic projector for the brain and you can make light in the shape of the dotted circle on the left where my mouse is pointing. Well, even though you aim light at one cell, you're gonna hit the axons and dendrites from other cells and all three starred cells will be driven. But if you make the opsins only express at the cell body and then aim light at the dotted circle, you won't hit the other two cells because their axons and dendrites are bare. So Orr found a peptide that will express a very powerful opsin, COCHR, just at the cell body. And collaborating with Valentina's group, their holographic projection showed that we could then activate cells very precisely without side effects and with very high speed. So that short story is about optogenetics. Um, these tools are all freely distributed from the website adgene.org and perhaps thousands of groups at this point are using such tools to control the brain and to discover what activating or silencing cells can do. Now, optogenetics is very powerful, but we were very lucky. These molecules had been evolved by microbes and it was just chance that they worked well in delicate, high-speed, fragile, demanding neurons. What about imaging brain activity? Unfortunately, the world has not evolved molecules for us in the natural wild. We have to evolve them in the laboratory. So when Erica Young and Carol Pjakovich were postdocs in my group, we built a robot that does evolution. Directed evolution allows you to take a gene and make many mutants. Some are better and some are worse for any given goal. We decided to build a robot that could evolve molecules to become indicators of neural activity. Why a robot? Well, we wanted to do the evolution in mammalian cells, and that's difficult. Furthermore, optogenetic tools that I told you about earlier are fast and safe and high amplitude. We wanted to make indicators that were fast and safe and high amplitude. That means you have to evolve in many directions. If you just make them faster, you might make them less safe. If you just make them safer, you might make them less fast. So what you see here is our robotic strategy. We make many mutants and put them into cultured cells. Then we use a microscope to scan the cells. Then a robotic arm will pull out the cells and therefore the mutants that are better for our goal. Using this robot, we took a molecule called Quasar 2 from Adam Cohen's group at Harvard and we made a fluorescent voltage indicator that we call Archon. It expresses very well in the membrane, so it's safe. It has good signal to noise. It's brighter than Quasar 2, and it's fast. Working with Shohan's group at BU, we showed that we could use this tool in awake behaving mice to image voltage. The microscope is shown in the upper left it's a fairly straightforward microscope. Shine light from a laser at the brain, a red laser, and collect the infrared light onto a camera. You can see in the middle of the slide, lots of traces that look like electrode traces, but they're not. These are the voltage of neurons being imaged in awake behaving mice. This is work led by Kirill, as well as Seth Bensusen and Wa Sang. Furthermore, because it's a camera and a microscope, you can image many cells. On the left are about a dozen cells in the hippocampus of an awake behaving mouse. On the right are the activity traces of eight of the neurons. You can see eight of these neurons are active. 
during the period of time we imaged. Now, in the last, uh, I forgot to mention, um, in these images, we also used the SOMA targeting idea. We targeted the voltage indicator just to the cell bodies. Why? Well, that cleans up the background fluorescence from axons and dendrites. If you express the voltage indicator everywhere, then everything is bright. The only reason we can see cell bodies clearly, as you can see, they appear as little dots, is that we have expressed these voltage indicators fused to peptides, so they end up at the cell body. That cleans up the background fluorescence and makes it much easier to see these neurons blink. Or Shemesh, Chang-Yang Lingu, and Kirill Pyakovich also did something similar with calcium indicators. We can express calcium indicators fused to peptides, and they will also express at the cell body. This also cleans up the background fluorescence. If the calcium indicators are everywhere, you have this sea of fluorescence. But if you express them just at the cell body, you can see discrete cells much more clearly. We showed in a recent paper that this cleans up the activity and makes it easier to see things in the living brain. So there's a bit of a theme here that's emerging. Can we target fluorescent indicators to parts of cells to get better information? But what if you could target fluorescent indicators to parts of cells to get new kinds of information? I want to end on a new story. This is work by Shannon Johnson and Cheng Yang Lingu in our group. The basic idea is wouldn't it be great if we could see many signals at once in a single living cell? If we want to understand how signals relate to each other, we have to image them at the same time in the same cell while it's alive. Well, how can you do that? Usually the way to do that is you have multiple colors. Maybe one fluorescent indicator is green and one is red, but that makes the optics more complicated. Also, you can only image a couple things. Imaging three, four, more sensors, that's really, really difficult, if not impossible. So we had the idea, what if we could cluster fluorescent indicators at different points in the cell? The points are far enough apart that you can resolve them in a microscope, but they're close enough that they sample the biology that you care about. So in the cartoon in the upper left, we have two kinds of indicator, cleverly named one and two. And let's suppose they all emit green light. When you image a living cell, it'll have lots of green dots. If you take a movie of these green dots in a microscope, you'll see green traces that go up and down. Of course, the question is, if each green dot is a different indicator, how can you tell them apart? Well, after you're done with the live imaging, you can preserve the cell and come in with an antibody that binds to each indicator and figure out what it was. So maybe you have a calcium indicator that blinks green information. After you're done, you come with an antibody that binds it and you can say, oh, those dots were calcium indicators. Then you might have another green dot and it has a different signal, but you don't know what it is. You preserve the cell and come with an antibody against that indicator or an epitope that's fused to it. And you can say, oh, that was an indicator of protein kinase A or cyclic AMP or ERK kinase or name your favorite molecule. You can wash antibodies in over and over again and image as many antibodies as you want. How do we do this? Well, we discovered that you could build pairs of self-assembling peptides and connect them to a fluorescent reporter and they will self-assemble into little clusters. So if you have two different reporters, a calcium indicator, for example, and a protein kinase A indicator, you can fuse them to two different self-assembling peptide sets, and they will then cluster at different random points throughout a cell. <clears throat> Here's an example of a calcium indicator, GCAMP6. We fuse it to a pair of self-assembling peptides. Normally, GCAMP6 will go throughout the cell. But here, where my mouse is pointing, you can see it'll self-assemble into small clusters. We did lots of experiments to show that cell health was not changed. We looked at membrane leak. We looked at DNA damage. We looked at, in the living brain, inflammation of microglia. We looked at action potential properties. 
we looked at lots and lots of different things to make sure that clusters were safe and effective. We also showed the signals were not corrupted by these peptides. We looked at the change in fluorescence, the signal to noise, the kinetics, and so forth, and found that those were not altered either. So now we can make lots of these, right? There are hundreds of fluorescent indicators out there. What if we could fuse all of them to different self-assembling peptide sets? This is a crowded slide, but just focus on where my mouse is pointing in the upper left. Here you can see in panel A, a cell that's full of green dots. Let's zoom in to the yellow squares. In panel C, for example, we'll zoom in below. And you can see a couple green dots. Now each one of these green dots reports a different fluorescent indicator. One of them is for calcium, one is for cyclic AMP, and one is for protein kinase A. That's because we took three different indicators, fused them to three different self-assembling peptide sets, and they self-assemble the different clusters. All three of them emit green light. But after we're done with the experiment, we take a movie of these green dots. We can then bring in antibodies that bind to small peptides that are epitopes that are fused to these, and we can tell you which one of the signals each of these dots was. This green dot, that was a cyclic AMP signal. This green dot, it's a PKA signal. This green dot, it was a calcium signal. What that means is we could image many different signals at the same time within a single living cell. And we can find relationships between the signals. So for example, some cells, these are cultured neurons, had fast calcium signals. Those are shown in panel um, I. If they had faster calcium signals, they had stronger protein kinase A signals. Some neurons had slower calcium signals. They had weaker protein kinase A signals. Now, if you image calcium and protein kinase A in two different cell populations, you would never see this relationship. We were able to derive a relationship. Fast calcium means stronger protein kinase A. This works in the intact brain as well. We took, um, uh, we delivered these sensors to the mouse brain and we cut acute brain slices so we could do easier imaging. And we found that the self-assembly still occurred. Here you can see protein kinase A and calcium indicators clustered into dots. After we're done, we bring in antibodies and we can stay them to tell you which dot means which sensor. And we were able to show a similar result. Neurons that had faster calcium responses had stronger protein kinase A signals. This is a crowded slide, but suffice it to say that we could express four sensors at a time, or even five at a time. Uh, the structure of these slides is similar to earlier slides. So the green dots that you see are live imaging of many sensors at once. So for example, where my mouse is pointing are four sensors being imaged and all of them emit green light. After we're done, we can antibody stain against epitopes on each one and tell you what each dot was. In this case, we're looking at calcium, cyclic AMP, protein kinase A, and protein kinase C. And you can then see four signals at once in a living cell. And at the bottom, we add a fifth color, a fifth sensor, excuse me, and we can then see five sensors at the same time. So we're very excited that we can now image potentially as many signals at once as you want in a living cell, just by expressing them at different parts of the cell. So to summarize the last part of the talk, we've been developing lots of new ideas for fluorescent imaging of high-speed dynamics of the brain. By building robots that do directed evolution, we can build new indicators for voltage and other signals in brain cells. We've also been exploring how to use targeting of molecules to parts of a cell. Initially to clean up fluorescence, like SOMA targeting of voltage and calcium indicators. But now we're also exploring whether we can do spatial multiplexing. That is, we target sensors to different parts of a cell so that many signals at once can be seen. Ideally, we would like to see all these technologies used together. In our group, we're starting to apply these tools to small brains like fish and worms. For example, Lamore Freifeld, when she was in my group, 
applied expand spectroscopy to zebrafish. And JU recently optimized it for the worm C. elegans. We also, in the paper I mentioned earlier, applied voltage imaging to zebrafish and to C. elegans. So I'll end there. I hope these tools are useful to you. We focus on making tools that are not only powerful, but very easy to use. You can go to our website, synthneuro.org, and find tutorials and access to these tools. And I'll end on this slide, which might be the most important one. All the people in the group at the top and our collaborators in the middle who worked on these projects that I told you about today. So I hope these technologies are helpful to you in your research. And if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out. And with that, I can take questions. Well, thank you so much for this great talk. I'm going to allow everybody to unmute. Uh, let me see how to do this. Uh, so that the, uh, all the participants can... Uh, okay, so now you can all unmute yourself and make directly questions to, to Ed. Uh, I have some questions also, but I would like to the audience to first have the chance to. Or either you you want to write your questions by the, in the chat, and I can uh, of course either retransmit or translate to so that Ed can respond. Okay, Lourdes, um, sí, te habilito. Okay, Lourdes. Um, as to mute. Okay, uh, there is one question here. Is is there any way? Sorry, let's move a little bit. Um, is there any way to target molecules to dendrites rather than soma? Good question. Um, a few papers have come out from groups like Don Arnold's and Frank Werblin's, where they have been able to target opsins to the soma, uh, to the dendrites. Um, it's not my area of expertise, but there are at least a couple of papers from the Werblin lab and the Arnold lab where, where they have been able to find peptides to target dendrites. Okay, and there is another question. The, the, the previous one was Andre, Andre's question. Now um, there is another question. Is there an upper limit for the concentration of sodium acrylate that you can use for a expansion microscopy? <clears throat> We're using sodium acrylate for at a very high concentration, probably around 35%. Um, yeah. In fact, that's one way to see whether the sodium acrylate that you're using has gone bad, is that you're not getting the full dissolving of all the sodium acrylate. But I think we're very close to the upper limit of solubility. But the high okay. concentration is, is, is helpful because it makes the, for the very dense polymer and the permeation of the specimen very evenly. Mm, okay. Uh, is there any other question? Anybody that wants to... Um, make a question directly? Okay, I, I have some questions. <laughs> uh, one is the... Um, have you tried this uh, immunostochemistry in expansion microscopy for a, a cell proliferation markers like... Um, for example, CLU, BLU. I was wondering if, as you span the ADN, DNA, if also allows to uh, avoid using HCL pretreatment, for example, can you do it without pretreatment? The immunosochemistry for for uh, timidine analogs, for example. <clears throat> 
Yeah, that's not my area of expertise. Uh, we don't do a lot in, in, the, in the DNA realm, uh, but several other groups are looking at um, you know, chromosomes and synaptonemal complexes and, um, and the nucleus uh, and, and so forth. And, and uh, I think what's emerging is this idea that if you can stain for something, um, you, should, you can give it a try. Yeah, so a lot of people are looking at the at the at the the DNA and, and other things. There's a several papers that have come out already, um, but it's not our group's focus. Okay, and I, I have another question. If there are any question from the audience? Please write or speak. You can unmute yourself. Um, I have another question. Meanwhile, is um, related to activity. For example, as as you as the Mainly with endogenous enzymes, uh, you know, for immunostochemistry, um, uh, for histochemistry, you need a kind of a relationship, a, a, a stereological relationship between uh, parts of the enzyme. When the when you grow the tissue, how how does it change or alters the activity of, of Let's see. So the expansion of the tissue uh, can only be. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No. No. It's a. It's a comment that the people cannot unmute. So I, there is something that I'm making wrong. I have to try to. No worries. Go for it. Uh, allow participant to unmute. Okay. Now. Is it okay now? Sorry, everybody. I'm... Yes, it works. Okay, sorry. <laughs> now, now you can raise your hands and and just make your questions. Yeah, so I had a question. Um, I was okay. curious. I was curious uh, if you have like a, a peptide bound to a protein and you used um, expansion microscopy. Would that dislodge any of those like peptides if you wanted to like track them in spatial, um, like if you wanted to look at hot spots of like where a particular peptide binds with a um, receptor in space with expansion microscopy? You think that would be an issue? Great question. If you apply the peptide before you expand, you could anchor the peptide and the target to the polymer, and expand them both. So then you would be able to see the relationships that you are talking about. But if you expand the proteins away from each other first and then apply the ligand, um, it depends. We use very high temperatures and a lot of detergent to soften up and denature the proteins from each other, to separate them from each other. And so the protein might be in an unnatural conformation afterwards. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. But yeah, if you have a, a, a protein in mind, and for all these questions, if you have a specific target in mind, uh, so uh, Maria, this applies to your question as well, send me a, um, an email about it and I can look it up to see if, if anybody's used that label. But yeah, this idea that if you can label it, it's worth trying expansion, it's, it's, it's kind of true. The, the tricky part, of course, is do you apply the labels before you expand or after? And that's where uh, there's a lot of debate right now. You know, many expansion groups apply labels before you expand because that's kind of the familiar state, right? You know it's going to bind because it's the same binding that you always do. But more and more people are interested in applying labels after you expand. And that's because the decrowding lets you have this, this unveiling of invisible things like I showed for the amyloid dots um, or for the calcium channels. But the downside is this is sort of kind of the wild frontier. So we don't know exactly what the state of the proteins is. I guess my mm -hmm. I, I guess my thought um, regarding uh, peptide receptor um, is let's say you want have a small neuropeptide that you're interested in, mm -hmm. and you want to map it with its you know receptors you know after a specific um, you know brain state or, or or something like that. Um, do you have to anchor the neuropeptide, and how big is the anchor usually? Let's say, um, will that affect its its ability to bind in a way? The anchors are very tiny. Um, so if you apply the peptide first and then it binds, 
And then you apply the anchor. The anchor is very small, around the size of a, maybe a little bit bigger than a fixative. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't interfere with anything. If you apply the, uh, the anchor and to the receptor first and then apply the peptide afterwards, the answer is it might work. Um, several groups are working on post-expansion staining protocols. Uh, not everything works when you apply them after you expand because again, the, the, the expansion process does change the proteins a bit. But in, in several papers, about 80% of the stains work. But it could be worth a shot because that's, that's much higher than 50%, not as, not as high as 100%. Um, but the decrowding effect can be truly stunning, if, if, uh, like we saw for the amyloid dots that might provoke entirely new ideas about Alzheimer's disease. So I would try it both ways. Try it with pre-expansion staining because that would be reliable. And then try with post-expansion staining because that would be a bit less reliable, but you might see things that, that nobody's ever imagined. Okay, well, there is another question here. You did uh, show mRNA imaging. Could the uh, expansion microscopy resolution be used to visualize small RNAs? Maybe. Um, the, the tricky part with small RNAs is that there's not much space for your probes to land. Um, so we've been focusing on messenger RNAs and long non-coding RNAs because you can bring in many fish probes, many probes, and have them land on different parts of the molecule. I would love to try going after small RNAs. Um, there's just so many things to do. But yeah, if, you, if, if somebody's interested in that and would like to try it, we'd love to give any advice or feedback on it. But, but yeah, there's, the problem with these tools is that there's so many things you can do with them and we kind of have to pick pick a subset. But if you all, if you're interested in that, we'd love to help. Okay, and the other question here, um, there is one that says, uh, why don't you use conventional tags to identify biosensor kinetics? Conventional tags? Is that what the question was? Yeah, it's just conventional tags. I don't know. Maybe Enora can, can explain by herself. Is it, is it the, the, the person is Enora who's asking. Maybe she can explain a little bit what means with conventional tags. Okay. Yeah. I can try to interpret the question. So. I assume this is referring to the last part where we have different biosensors at different points. And then we use antibodies against epitopes to identify the biosensors. You, you could also try to use the kinetics of the biosensor to tell them apart. You know, calcium has very fast kinetics. Protein kinase A has very slow kinetics. But since this is the first paper on the technology, we wanted to really prove uh, that it worked. And so that's why we use the antibodies as a sort of ground truth. But um, by eye, you can kind of guess what the, the biosensors are from their kinetics quite often. And so maybe that's one way that people will do it in the future. Okay, it doesn't seem to be more question, but I, I would like to ask you something. Just, I mean, if in some way, all, all of, of what you have shown us in a, is kind of, you are being making things possible when everybody thought it was impossible <laughs> before. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, for me, it's very intriguing how, how you, how you um, confront with the reality to think in such different way. I mean, as you, as at the beginning of your talk, in, instead of increasing the resolution of micro, microscopy, that is very difficult <laughs> because of the physical limits, you just turn the way around and say, well, why don't we increase the size of the thing we are analyzing? So this kind of uh, different approach, how, 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 I mean, if you can just comment uh, something about this and, and then the, 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 related to this, uh, the next question would be, well, which is your next uh, dream in some way? I mean, which is your next uh, uh, limit that you would like to, to 
to surpass, to <laughs> make it around, to, to make it possible things. Yeah. So to answer your first question, we often start just by thinking of all the ways of solving the problem. So I mentioned our optogenetics. Uh, Carl Dysproth and I started just by thinking about magnetic fields, mechanical force. There's only a handful of energies that you can deliver to the brain. You know, sound, light, radio, and that's mm -hmm. about it, right? Um, and similarly, uh, you know, we often think about what are the resources we have available? Mm -hmm. Both the um, expansion microscopy and the clustering for multiplexing, both of these try to use space in a novel way. You know, lots of people are using color. Lots of people are using um, you know, time. But could we use space? In the expansion case, we physically expand the object. In the spatial multiplexing case, we target different reporters to different parts of the cell. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, so we, we often begin by trying just to make a list of all the ways to solve the problem. And you think there's only so many things. There's space. There's time, there's energy, and each of those comes in different ways, right? Space has, you know, physical expansion, different parts of the cell, energy, you know, there's light, sound, radio. And so that's how I like to think about things. Let's be systematic. Can we think of all the, all the ways of solving a problem? And then um, your second question is what's the next big thing, I guess? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm very excited about this idea of spatial multiplexing. I would love to combine the last idea I share, the spatial multiplexing yeah. with the robot to do evolution. You know, suppose mm -hmm. you really want to understand how signals go from one part of the cell to another, or how you go from synapses to the gene expression, or, you know, to encode a memory. You know, um, we really have to see lots of signals at once. And so here's something I'd love to try next. The robot that does evolution, what if we can make a hundred new indicators very quickly? And then with the spatial multiplexing, we can target all 100 indicators to different parts of the cell. Could we, could we make the first really systematic map of an entire very complex signaling cascade, like the ones involved with memory or the ones involved with a disease? And so that's kind of a new dream. You know, what would it take to see you know, all the processes in a living cell that are, are related to a, an interesting thing like learning or a yeah. disease? Yeah, you know, you know, for for me, it's, it's extraordinary because, in some way, you are you are trying to jump, in uh, from one level of integration to another to kind of make it possible to understand how the the, the merchant properties of the brain can 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 to can true. I mean, how are created the emergent properties? When you say all the process involving memory. So you, yeah, maybe you are getting into these mechanisms that make possible from the brain tissue to emerge in a cognitive process. So kind of jumping this uh, enigma that we, we, we still have in neuroscience. Yeah, yeah. That's the whole idea of integration, right? Can you bring the tools yeah. together to see and control yeah. entire systems. I think that can be very helpful in, in understanding many kinds of neural function and dysfunction. But yeah, that's, a, that's kind of where we'd like to go next is to start integrating things. Well, there are some, if you have some minutes, some more minutes, there are some more questions uh, or comments. Uh, can, can you quantify amount of signal in extension, expansion microscopy? Is this trustworthy? Yeah. yeah, I replied in the chat window. Um, I mean, all antibody staining methods require calibration if you want absolute levels, and expansion is the same. Um, but the RNA staining, because we understand nucleic acids very well, is, is very quantitative. Okay, there is another comment or question here from Meriman Alulu. Uh, there is a way to expand a small particle, not cells or organs, but an isolated structure like a vesicle? Yeah, Aaron Schumann's group has already published a paper in Science where they isolate small vesicles called synaptosomes, um, fragments of synapses, and they use expansion microscopy to visualize them. Yeah, so that's possible. Okay, and Leonel Malcrida is asking, um, consider new optogenetic tool developed by Brainwain Lab 
such optoliquid droplets or protein precipitates within a single cell in vivo at the brain. Such optoliquid droplets or protein precipitates within a single cell in vivo at the brain. So did you explore or you know if there is any research exploring such experiments? That's not my area of expertise, unfortunately, so I don't know the answer. But I do know several people are using expansion microscopy to look at these phase-separated regions. Um, there's already one paper looking at RNA granules using expansion microscopy. They show that two different proteins are found in different parts of these granules. Um, again, I don't know much about this, but, but people are starting to apply some of our tools to these things. Okay. Well, there are no more questions. Uh, I really would like to thank you so much for your time, right. for sharing nice all your knowledge. It was a great talk. And thank you. I think we'll everybody is very, very, very glad about that. We'll stay in touch and try out the tools. And if we can help in any way, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Everybody says excellent talks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> 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 in in Spanish, time. in English. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, excellent, Maria. <laughs> Thank you. Well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. You too. Gracias a todos. Ha sido un gusto. Y bueno, no se pierdan la próxima presentación que va a ser el lunes que viene, 19, eh, a las 6 de la tarde. Les aviso para los interesados. Linda Richards from Australia. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>